All right. So, um, okay. So, uh, I am so happy to have this opportunity to share with you uh, some findings from my research on the impact of ACEs on health outcomes. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Thank you. When I say ACEs, I am referring to adverse childhood experiences. Um, and my title today is how attachment anxiety shapes the link between ACEs and somatic symptoms in college students. Okay. So it's a long title, uh, but there, this, this presentation here is really about two things. The first one is about this link between, oh, let me use my pointer. So um, the first thing is really about this link between ACEs and somatic symptoms. And the second thing is about the role of this so-called attachment anxiety, the role of attachment anxiety in this link between ACEs and somatic symptoms. For today's uh, presentation, I may have to spend a little more time in explaining why I put these three variables together. I believe that would make the results much more straightforward. I want to mention that this research uh, was supported by the Better Options Initiative, and it was part of a larger project looking at the impacts of parental separation. And the findings have been published in the journal Child Abuse and Neglect. In 1998, CDC and Kaiser Permanente conducted a seminal study with over 7,000 adults. And they examined 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences that occurred before a person turned the age of 18. ACEs could include um, abuse, neglect, and a range of problems that occur in a dysfunctional household. This seminal study, uh, study has inspired research, looking into the staggering consequences of ACEs well into adulthood. There are these so-called dose-response relations you know, uh, between ACEs and many health outcomes. It's that the more ACEs, the worse health outcomes. Well, ACEs involve traumatic social emotional experiences early in life. And it is not surprising to see the links between ACEs and mental health outcomes such as depression, anxiety, suicidality, and social relationship disruptions, substance abuse problems, and so on. But probably the most striking finding from this study was that after controlling all the mental health factors, lifestyle choices, and risky behaviors, there was still this robust link between ACEs and physical health conditions. So what kind of physical health conditions are we talking about here? We're talking about obstructive pulmonary disease. We're talking about hepatitis, obesity, diabetes, high pressure, or ischemic heart disease, or even cancer and death. So I began to wonder whether these patterns, these results and reports also apply to our college students. I chose to look at a physical condition that is quite prevalent among emerging adults and that condition involves somatic symptoms. Somatic symptoms refer to distressing bodily sensations or physical dysfunctions that occur in certain body parts or organs. They may cause psychological distress, impaired daily functioning, and compromised life quality. And some of the somatic symptoms do not have clear medical explanations. And some of them tend to be persistent and difficult to assess and manage. And some of them tend to be comorbid with 
mood issues. These symptoms have presented challenges to healthcare professionals and have incurred unnecessary, uh, unnecessary medical expenses in our society. And in fact, there is this emerging line of ACEs research that points to the links between ACEs and somatic symptoms. So the question becomes whether there, there is a link where there's a dose response relation between ACEs and somatic symptoms in our UL Lafayette college population. But we also know that not all individuals exposed to ACEs eventually develop somatic symptoms as adults. So we need to ask, what factors would potentially influence the impacts of ACEs? This is a very important question to ask because if we can identify some factors that potentially determine the impacts of ACEs, and if they happen to be malleable and changeable, then we may be able to mitigate the negative impacts of ACEs. So what I'm really asking is, what makes some people more or less vulnerable to somatic symptoms following exposure to ACEs? For this study, I am coming from this theoretical perspective, namely biopsychosocial perspective. Um, according to this perspective, physical illnesses can be caused by not only physiological function, dysfunctions, but also psychological factors that lead to stress in our lives. When our body needs to respond to stress repeatedly and for a long time, our stress response systems may become dysregulated, which eventually become manifested as physical conditions, symptoms. The idea is really about this notion that there could be social determinants of physical illnesses. So examining the links, the link between ACEs and somatic symptoms is really in line with this thinking. But there are other determinants that have to do with our social experiences that may potentially come into play in terms of the ACEs, um, uh, the consequences of ACEs. Some of them may involve how we think about what happens in our social life, how we our social experiences. So these factors are referred to as social cognitive factors. One of the social cognitive factors that I have been very, very interested in is called attachment insecurity. And, and the reason why it's called social cognitive factor, you would understand you know, as, I, as I explain more. Um, but this attachment and security, um, the notion of um, attachment and security is really based on the classic uh, attachment theory laid out by John Bowlby. According to the attachment theory, we form working models of attachment while growing up within the context of close relationships, particularly the parent-child relationship. So when the attachment context is not sensitive, not nurturing, not supported enough, and very often the child would develop this attachment insecurity. There are two dimensions of attachment insecurity. So one is called attachment anxiety. Attachment anxiety involves negative views of the self. The reason why these negative things, these bad things, these traumatic things happened to me, it was because I was not good. I was bad. So these negative views of the self are often associated with anxiety over rejection and abandonment. These thoughts 
um, would relate to this thinking, this tendency to rely on others, others' validation to validate self-worth. Another dimension is called attachment avoidance. It involves negative views of others or negative views of the world. The reason why bad things happen to me is because other people are not trustworthy. They're bad. The world is not a safe place to be in. So these negative views would often be associated with this behavioral tendency to avoid close relationships because that's one of the ways to feel, to avoid those close relationships, to feel safe, to prevent from being harmed. Okay, so these negative views are in our thoughts, they're in our cognition. And that's why we call them cognitive representations of self and others. And one can be either high or low on either of the dimensions. And that's why we have this two by two combinations for attachment working models and for attachment styles. Modern descriptions of attachment have updated Bowlby's original theory of attachment and view attachment as a biopsychosocial safety regulation system. That involves perceptual, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral elements orchestrated to produce strategic actions for, to feel safe and secure. So imagine within these early attachment context, you know, the parent-child diet would engage in this ongoing, you know, this dynamic, it's intimate uh, interactions. And these interactions involve not only two minds, but also two bodies. So for example, there will be this, uh, these um, rhythmic and prosodic exchanges of facial, vocal, and gestural, and postural expressions and behaviors. And so these interactions gradually influence and organize the developmental processes of neurobiological systems, which in turn form the physiological patterns underlying how we process emotions and stressful situations. Therefore, Modern perspectives of attachment systems consider attachment insecurity as reflections of dysregulated stress response systems that um, ultimately contribute to variations in physical outcomes. The thing is that two people may experience pretty much the same traumatic experiences and how they frame the traumatic experiences can be very different, resulting in different attachment working models, thus different safety regulation patterns, and ultimately different physiological function. So I hope what I just talked about helped explain why I put these variables together. We collected a sample of college students. Um, we had them respond to the uh, ACES questionnaire. And we used the experience in close relationship scale, short form, to assess their attachment anxiety, uh, attachment insecurity. Um, and we used the somatization subscale of the SCL90R to assess their somatic symptoms. One thing before I go on to talk about results, um, I'd like to mention that the findings on the uh, attachment avoidance uh, dimension did not yield significant findings. So um, this was not a surprising finding because um, it, um, the, this finding actually was in line with a number of studies indicating reporting non-significant findings about avoidance attachment avoidance. If we have time, we can circle back to this to discuss why this is the case. Okay. 
what we found was that we indeed find the uh, dose response relations between ACEs and somatic symptoms, as you could see, that there is positive relation between um, somatic symptoms and ACEs. We also found this dose response relation uh, between pattern anxiety and ACEs. Further, the pattern anxiety and somatic symptoms were correlated, significantly correlated. Therefore, these three variables are mutually correlated. We observed gender differences in all three variables. Females reported higher scores on all the variables, the main study variables. And so uh, because of the gender differences, uh, gender differences, and so we control gender in our regression model. Um, this table here shows the prevalence of each of 10 categories of ACEs. Um, and if we look at the lower part of this table, you would see that close to you know, approximately 70% of our college students, they reported at least one ACE. And about 12% of our college students reported at least five ACEs. These numbers are right on par with the CDC's 1998 reports on the prevalence of ACEs. And so essentially we replicated the findings. Here we have a loaded slide and I try, I'll try to unravel the information here. Um, but this figure tells us the stories about the three variables. Um, but the main story is about the relation, the link between ACEs and somatic symptoms, okay? And as you can see here, there are three regression lines, okay? uh, But you can imagine that there, there, there are countless numbers of lines, you know, uh, here. Uh, but if you look closely, you will find that uh, these lines have different slopes. And when attachment anxiety, you know, those lines with higher levels of attachment anxiety are steeper than those lines with lower levels of attachment anxiety. Okay? So um, uh, after the uh, slope analysis, actually when um, what we found was that when attachment anxiety was low, there was no relation between ACEs and somatic symptoms. Um, so attachment anxiety determines the slope of the regression line representing the link between ACEs and somatic symptoms. Using a statistical term, uh, we say that attachment anxiety moderated the link between ACEs and somatic symptoms. And that's what my title means. Attachment anxiety shapes the link between ACEs and somatic symptoms. Okay. Just to summarize, what we found was that um, exposure to ACEs seemed to confer risk for developing attachment anxiety and somatic symptoms in adulthood. Also, attachment anxiety was associated with somatic symptoms. We inferred that the more anxiously attached, uh, anxiously attached a person was, the stronger the link between ACEs and somatic symptoms would be. When attachment anxiety was low, ACEs did not correlate with somatic symptoms. So we inferred that attachment anxiety makes people more vulnerable to somatic symptoms following exposure to ACEs. So the findings revealed how social, cognitive, and emotional experiences jointly increase the susceptibility to developing physical health issues. 
the takeaway from the findings here. We cannot change, uh, change what happened in the past. We have no ways of changing what already happened. But we may potentially change, revise, reformulate working models of attachment. After all, these are cognitive representations of self and others. And you know, these are how we frame who we are as a person and whether the world is a safe place or not, whether others are trustworthy. And these thinking, these uh, views could potentially be changed. And importantly, these thoughts are closely connected to our physiological patterns of stress response. And then our strategic action as to deciding whether we approach or we avoid certain social close relationships. So if we change our working models of attachment, that is to change our safety regulation system. Our physiological patterns, stress response may change accordingly, which may be one of the ways that we mitigate the impact of ACEs on our physical condition. That's my presentation. And I would um, welcome your feedback and your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Lin. I found the results to be fascinating, especially one of the, the conclusion you have here <clears throat> just made the results so much clearer and the implication so much clearer. So thank you very much. So now we're going to open it up for questions. So there are two ways to ask questions. You could unmute yourself and ask questions. Um, if someone is talking and you want to be the next, feel free to raise your hand using the reaction button at the bottom of your Zoom. Um, and I'll know that you're the next. Or you can line up in your chat. So you can put your question in the chat and then uh, Dr. Lin would uh, see that and I can help to moderate that. And uh, we can answer the question one by one from the chat room too. So two ways, either unmute yourself and ask question or type your responses in the chat. Any questions? Yep, someone raised their hand. Who's that? Oh, is that? Uh, oh, Dr. Perkins. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, good. Thank you for, thank you for sharing. Uh, well, your work welcome. on this. My pleasure. I think that it's important work. I mean, I think that that there's there's a lot of convergence from a lot of different subdisciplines within and outside of psychology that are recognizing more and more um, some very useful ways of conceptualizing things that happen to people as children. I guess a, a question that I have, you know, because this last slide that you're sharing, <laughs> you, you know definitely sounds like feels like a, an invitation for people in the clinical or counseling areas of, of psychology, you know, because it's like an angle, it's a potential angle for therapy or for interventions. And I'm, I guess a, a question I'm answering is, are you aware of or have you run across people who are doing work in this area from the clinical standpoint, who are trying to use some of these ideas as like a have you have you like run across anything where people have written articles where they're using these ideas as like a foundation for building an approach for counseling or therapy interventions? Because it seems like it'd be a natural fit, right? A natural progression of this. I really appreciate that question. Um, first of all, I am not a clinical person. Uh, so, but then I did look into the literature in terms of, you know, uh, the implications of the findings. So we, if we say, if we infer that, you know, if we change our working models, it, things may work, right? Uh, but then would there be any, uh, you know, therapy or any types of counseling um, that are really, you know, addressing attachment insecurity per se, right? And I think that's a very important question. And yes, um, I, on top of my head, I 
could not recall the name of it, but they, there are certain counseling, uh, you know, certain uh, schools of thoughts of counseling. They're trying to revise working models of um, attachment. They're trying to revise uh, working models of attachment by uh, establishing this trusting relationship between the clinician and the client and trying to change their ways of framing their experiences um, as a person and also framing um, the, their ideas and represent, representations of the world uh, from a different angle, right? Uh, so uh, those are kind of approaches that I have, I, I, have, I have encountered in the literature and essentially they're trying to you know, re, kind of reparent the client through counseling relationships. That's what I found so far. Well, thank you. And you know, and, and as a clinical psychologist, I'm definitely um, find value in the research done from the developmental specialty, like what the kind of work you're doing. Yes, it, it, it's it's um, from a slightly different angle, but it's so so valuable to kind of like think about these things and the impacts that they make. I would. Uh, it also makes me think about how already established, some already established forms of therapy or counseling might have another avenue to just conceptualize what's happening when change takes place, because there are certain common kinds of processes that occur in all forms of therapy. And I think that what this, the revising or changing working models is one way that potentially the lots of different therapeutic change impacts or could be thought of as impacting that so thank you thank you for your input and feedback and you know this is one of the ways that potentially would you know um improve or mitigate or reduce the impacts of aces uh of course there are other you know many other things that can be done but this is something that um that needs to be uh highlighted you know because a lot of times cognitive representations could be implicit um, sometimes, uh, and maybe actually a lot of times that people are largely unaware of their cognitive representations. And, and, and actually these working models are the template of, um, you know, certain ha have been serving as templates of their behavioral tendencies, right? So the reason why they decide to adopt certain strategies in a social context, either to approach this person or not, you know, um, has, been, has been driven, if you would, to, uh, by these really sometimes implicit working models that have been you know, operating underlying the, these behaviors that we see outwardly. So I, I think it's, it's um, something that's worth uh, paying attention to and, and that uh, have been inspired by this research because measures that the measure that we use uh, was a questioning. So when we gather the information is really more about the explicit the, um, the awareness of the participants. So when they responded to the questionnaire, they knew what they were responding to. Um, and uh, so the next step is to look into the implicit ideas, you know, using some implicit association tests, something like that, to assess their attachment anxiety, their attachment dimensions. That's my next, that's what I uh, would like to do next. Thank you. Um, so we got the first student question in the chat, uh, so I'm going to read that out. And I want to encourage all students to ask questions, and students' questions do get priority, okay? So make sure you ask questions. It's a great opportunity for y'all to interact with uh, the speaker uh, in, in psychological research, so I encourage students to ask questions. Okay, so here is the question we get. Uh, Madeline asks, like, do you think that these results will be different if they were separated by gender? So if you analyze it by gender, would that be different, do you think? We did, uh, we did as I mentioned, we did find gender differences. So uh, we did not uh, treat gender as one of the moderators. It would be a good idea to look into that, Madeline. Um, and I appreciate that question. You just inspired me to look into this, you know, results by gender. Uh, definitely, you know, we already see the gender differences in three variables and you know, whether the pattern 
that we found the moderated relation between ACS and somatic symptoms would differ by gender, that would be great to see. That would be very interesting to look into. We can work on that together. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dr. Lin. You are welcome. Thank you, Patrick. Great. So here we have another question from Cameron. Cameron, would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Yes, ma'am. Um, I kind of have a question. Um, it's almost for future research. Um, how do you mm -hmm. think the pandemic will uh, like affect as a particular ACE? Because this is the first generation in 100 years we could collect data on this scale of people who grew up during a pandemic. What a wonderful question. Um, I have to say that the ACES questionnaire that we used, it only included 10 questions, you know, 10 categories. It's a very um, concise form of, you know, questionnaire in terms of assessing traumatic experiences. There are other uh, traumatic questionnaires, uh, traumatic experiences, questionnaires for assessing traumatic experiences um, out there, you know. Uh, but uh, more and more people are looking into traumatic experiences experienced by a lot of people, like 9-11, like hurricane, like pandemic. Now, that's definitely a very good point. And so uh, we need to kind of extend the so-called trauma or traumatic experiences above and beyond the 10 categories there. You know? And more and more people are looking into just by uh, ISIS questionnaire, there are different ways of looking into ACEs and you know, not just counting yes and no, and then you know, really refine the measure to include more information. Uh, so definitely, you know, future, future research direction. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Lin. You're welcome, Cameron. Yeah, while we're waiting for the next question, I actually thought that, that was a great point raised. Uh, and during the pandemic, some people are concerned about people that are stuck at home, especially if ACEs, a lot of them come from home. And if uh, these early adult or teenagers, they're stuck at home, would that actually um, make the impact of ACEs on their well being even worse? Manu, I think that's a great point. And actually, we have seen reports after reports, particularly coming from the um, you know, pediatrics, the more medical journals, reporting um, some um, domestic violence and abuse situations. And very early on, pediatricians have been calling that, wow, this you know, shutdown, this um, quarantine has been causing lots of issues. You know? And if you're looking to uh, UNICEF uh, website, lots of concerns about you know, children being at home with parents and all that, uh, definitely putting some kids at risk of uh, abuse and, and some neglect. Parents had to leave home for other you know, for jobs and you know, trying to find the means end. And uh, the means met, how do you say that? <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, trying to, uh, you know, um, tag, uh, tackle the financial burdens. And so, yes, definitely, that's a, a very good point. Very good point. And actually, lots of people are at collecting data on that. Already. Yeah, that, it'll be interesting to see um, what's going on there. Metany, did I see that you raised your hand earlier. Did I miss it? Yes, but I think Dr. Christie had her hand up before me. <laughs> Student gets priority. So, Metany, if you want to go ahead and ask <laughs> questions, um, I'm pretty sure Dr. Charles will be okay to wait. Yeah. <laughs> Madeline, take advantage of your priority. <laughs> She's my advisor. I could just see her without. I, could just see her every day. I saw your question there. Was, was it actually, a question? Was actually, no, I was going to ask a different question. That one was just okay. an idea, Dr. Lin. I had a question actually. Um, about like, I forgot, did you look at whether the ACEs also contribute to what kind of attachment style they form in, to begin with? If ACEs mod moderate this effect, like, do they also moderate, like, do ACEs, do, like, uh, sorry, if attachment styles also have an effect between ACEs and stress, d 
does ACEs also affect attachment styles itself, though? I forgive you've already looked at that. Sorry. Uh, oh, you were saying, yeah, that's 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 a fabulous question. ACEs, some, you know, we, we're talking about ACEs. We, what the data, what I collected was the retrospective recall of what happened, right? Some of the experience, traumatic experiences are ongoing, right? So yeah, you experience something and then that influence how you formulate your cognitive representations of self and others. And then, you know, experiences ongoing, trauma is there still. And then that would add to or you know, mitigate. It really depends on what the experiences are, right? Definitely. So there could be some, you know, in, in some iteration and then, you know, neutral uh, influences in terms of whether it's ACEs or whether it's um, attachment anxiety. So your attachment working models could be uh, updated really due to the kind of experiences that you are going through. So especially when traumatic experiences are ongoing, yeah. So that's a that's a that's a very very good point, very very good point, definitely. And again, this is a cross section of the yeah. Now we are we're making inferences, although uh, we we're doing this moderation analysis, uh, and uh, there's a big assumption there. Uh, we're having them recall what happened in the past, and then you know some of the experiences maybe still are um, maybe still present in the person's life um, and that would definitely influence how they respond to their uh, assessment you know uh, attachment or attachment right? great thanks dr lynn you're welcome christy yes um i wanted to kind of piggyback off of what Cameron asked, that wonderful question regarding COVID, you know, and listening to everything that has happened since, uh, like, school closures, that's one of the biggest things that um, advocates of, uh, as far as opening back schools, people are saying, you know, we're not catching the abuse, you know, if they were in school, we could see it. But what popped into my, my, my mind when Cameron asked that question just just thinking a lot of students had to move back home due to COVID-19. So I, I, I'm wondering what type of role that would play because now you have young adults, you know, living at home, maybe they've lost their jobs. Now we're talking about anxiety, attachment issues. I, I'm, I'm just wondering what, 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 what would happen? What would, what would the data say regarding that now, particularly due to COVID-19 and people like living together? We need research to answer those questions, definitely. Okay, uh, Dr. Michael. Where is Hi, Dr. Is Lynn. Thank Robert? You the, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, thank you. I have so many questions, but I'm going to try and limit myself just to one. <laughs> <laughs> just to be careful. Um, I'm wondering if in the conceptualization of these adverse experiences, you, you kind of talked earlier about how it's done at a sort of course, just count level, at least, at least in some of these studies. I'm wondering if there's room for thought about the, the type and the severity of these different experiences and how that leads to different types of outcomes and whether it's in fact possible that some mediating or moderating factors like um, attachment style, for example, can fundamentally not only maybe change the slope of that regression line, but maybe even lead to situations where these experiences are no longer adverse into the future that they could lead to growth type of experiences or resiliency building experiences but i don't know if that's if that's pushing things too far or too out. not at all not at all and as you're right robert the uh, and i mentioned earlier that the aces question there 10 items binary yes and no I, um, actually, I had a, a lab meeting about this, and I think Rick was there as well. We were saying that 
This is such a, a, a concise, you know, even like a screening tool, right? And it's the, it doesn't address frequency. It doesn't uh, address the, you know, how long the experiences have been persisting. It doesn't address the severity level. It doesn't address many factors associated with in terms of traumatic experiences. Right. So yeah, definitely, those are really important uh, elements to address when we want to have a more refined models, um, you know, a, a refined model to uh, have a better prediction. Right. De definitely. And so yeah, um, I totally agree. Um, in, you know, adopting uh, more refined measures would question better. Uh, definitely not ACEs. Uh, the yes, no, 10 items there. Um, and then, you know, there are certain experiences uh, that would occur during childhood were not included in this ACEs study. For example, being bullied, right? Or being discriminated against, right? Like Madeline was asking about certain, you know, uh, minority group experiences, racial issues uh, being, uh, discriminated against. These are traumas. These are, uh, they could go into our body, it could go through our skin to go into our physical and biological functioning. And so ACEs questionnaire do not cover those experiences. And what about, you know, those you know, genocide, you know, for people coming from uh, parts of the world that, you know, they were under severe threat of, death, and, you know, or they, they went through hung, hunger and deprivation, severe deprivation. All those experiences are, you know, really severe and not included in ACEs. Uh, so this, um, this ACEs questionnaire came out of medical model. These people are, you know, really medically minded and even a little bit psychoanalytically minded as is, you know, in a sense, I have to say. Uh, and, and, you know, if you go into their research, you will see the way they try to explain the results. And, you know, it's, it really started with a uh, obesity treatment group. Um, and then they found that certain people dropped out uh, in the, you know, uh, before the program completed. And they looked into those people and they realized that these people actually were doing the best. You know, they were actually showing improvement. And why did they drop out, drop out of the, uh, this program? And they began to think, hmm, it's really something unconscious. You see, this is when really psycho and you know, the psychodynamics is come, you know, came, comes in. And they, they were thinking, they were speculating that, you know, for some people who have been dealing with obesity for some time, for them to see improvement, it's not necessarily, it's good to them, but for them, it's very vulnerable. That makes them feel naked. Yeah. And that's part of the reasons that they dropped out of the program. And so they began to think, oh, what exactly happened in the past, right? You know, we have clinicians, we have scholars who do not necessarily look into what happened in the past, right? And, and so that's the reason why you can see that you now the screening tool and also the study itself, you know, the, you know very medically minded and very, uh, you know, in a sense, like you know, psychodynamically minded. Thank you. Come to ask other questions, Robert. No, I should let somebody else ask you. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? It could be anything that you want Dr. Lin to clarify or some extension question. Um, anything? I kind of had one that's kind of bouncing around in my head that I'm trying to formulate. <laughs> Amrit, yes. go ahead as you talk. Okay. Um, I was trying to think of almost from an organizational perspective is like how ACEs may affect the like millennial workforce after having to deal with such a global wide problem. I'm wondering how this is gonna rear its head in the next year or so. I am so happy that you are having this go, uh, you know, view. Um, you know, CDC has made this ACEs 
um, issue, a public health issue. Okay, so actually there have been movements uh, across the entire na nation to trying to promote this awareness of what ACEs could, could do to us, right? The consequences, mental and physical consequences. So there are you know, movements um, across different uh, parts of the country. Um, some of the schools are now become trauma-informed or ACEs-informed universities or schools and so on, right? Um, and and uh, that's the reason why, I mean, it, it needs to be, uh, people needs to be addressed uh, to be informed and also educated, you know, so that people can look into what is happening right now, what could potentially be some things that happen or could be linked to certain things that happened in the past that were not really addressed, right? And so, in, in, yeah, uh, actually we have in Louisiana, just to make it more specific to us, uh, in Louisiana, we have this ACES training program, we have ACE educators, and very, very soon, if you would be interested, now I'm involved with this community ACES task force. We're trying to line up, we're trying to align with um, LPSS, school education system, the, um, the mental health professionals, and also uh, criminal justice uh, people. You know, we have, you know, we have a lot of people uh, involved, uh, criminal justice uh, involved population. They experience a lot of uh, issues. Okay. So yeah, we are doing it and actually Lafayette, we're going to start um, this ACE education program and, and hopefully um, that that could be that could happen very soon. Um, so hopefully we could uh, form this community network uh, to uh, better address ACEs issues, you know, consequences of ACEs as a community. That's what we have been working on. Thank you. That's really interesting because I find myself being very medically minded before, like I came into university. And to get more exposure to ACEs and in that domain of psychology and how that might affect medicine in the future, it's very like interesting and how it can change my approach. Wow. Wow. You're welcome. Welcome to contact me. We could talk more about this. Great. Thank you. And next, Dr. MacGyver, do you have a question? Um, really, I think there's just a very simple question that I wanted to ask, which was that. I understand that there are that you are involved in a task force for doing research with ACES, and I thought you might like to say more about that research program and how students might get involved. Um, Val, you were asking uh, the task force. It's it's more about the you know a, a community task force. It's not really about research um, project. Uh, Although we're trying to introduce to the community what uh, people are doing in, uh, at the university in terms of research projects and what we have been, you know, what in our interests are, but it's really more about establishing a community network. Uh, I think you were included in the email list every time when we send out an uh, email list to invite people. If you're interested in that community task force, you know, uh, please contact me. We, we need more people. Um, and you know, very soon, we hope that uh, actually in April, we're going to have a, a one day summit or something like that to uh, just to have people coming from different community entities to get to know each other. Um, and those people who share similar interest in addressing the issues, the consequences of ACEs, would come together and know each other. And then hopefully we could do something for the community. So the entire community could become ACEs informed. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, not easy, but if you will be interested, we would love to have you. Can I address your question, Val? 
enough. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a question for Dr. Lin yeah. about ACES. Um, hey, friends. Hey, um, have you looked at ACES um, across generations, just like the factors that can, um, I guess, increase or decrease the continuity, the intergenerational continuity? Ever looked at that at all? Uh, Prince, uh, you asked the question, um, and, and uh, I'm glad that I'm able to address this question to some extent. And, uh, we actually have a uh, one of the current projects of the lab is to look into intergenerational continuity of ACEs. Okay, so uh, it tends to be, it tends to, uh, ACEs tend to occur across generations. So there is this intergenerational continuity. Um, so actually it started, this project started out as a project that uh, Whitney, Whitney's came to me after uh, one of the summits, uh, AC summit uh, about two years ago. And she was so passionate about looking into ACEs that occur in the criminal justice population she, because she's, she works with people at jail. And so she was very interested in that. So at this, uh, first we were, um, we were going to look into um, people who are, incarcerated and in jail and their children, how they parent their children. Uh, and because parental incarceration is one of the issues, right? And so we want to see what that means to the child, you know, whose parent is being incarcerated. Um, so we had some beautiful ideas, but it didn't work out. So we decided, okay, we turn around and look into our college population, but we really wanted to look at uh, college students, if they are parents, okay? So they're parents and they report their own faces, but what about their children? What their children is doing, uh, their children are going through. And also we recruited, um, college students' parents as well, okay? So we're trying to see whether there would be some intergenerational continuity across three generations. And that's quite an ambitious project. What's going on? Um, we haven't, uh, we haven't really, uh, we have some data. So we're trying to come up with some preliminary results. Uh, hopefully at some point I could update you uh, with this product, the, the findings coming from this result. And definitely that's a very important issue to address and more and more people are trying to address this intergenerational continuity. Thank you. You're welcome, Prince. Thank you. So I think that we're almost time, but if there's like one more question, I think we can handle that. Any other last question? May I say something, Menu? Sure. Mm -hmm. So before the end of this meeting, and I'm really calling to our colleagues and also our students that we psychologists, we play very important roles in really trying to advance, to promote the awareness of the consequences of ACEs. And also, you know, you guys are going out to work with people. Um, and you know, maybe this is something that you could consider to incorporate into your practices. Um, but uh, as a psychologist, I think you know, I also would like to see more in terms of our roles on campus, trying to uh, kind of you know promote the awareness um, of this idea. Uh, so uh, for social scientists. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to pay attention to these issues. But we have colleagues, we have students coming from sciences or engineering, they probably never thought of things like this, right? And uh, if we could um, have more people know about this, and actually um, it would be beneficial to the entire, you know, entire well-being of the entire community the university population as well as our community population.
So again, if you are interested, let me know. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Lin. And uh, I, I, I agree that um, uh, understanding ACEs, uh, people past experiences are very important. And this is not something that people as a psychology may be aware of. Um, so that's a great point. Um, so we're, we're going to wrap up today. I just want to remind everyone that uh, the recording will be available on uh, psychology major Moodle page and graduate student Moodle page. I made it available. And uh, also the previous um, uh, talk, I made, made them available. And then uh, the next uh, brown bag would be second Friday in March, which is March 12th. Um, so I'll send out a reminder about a week before that, but mark that on your calendar. Um, I think that's all. <laughs> Have a great weekend uh, and great break. Stay warm, everyone. I know it's going to be super cold. <laughs> Stay warm. Um, take care. See you all. Bye. Happy Mardi Gras. Thank you, Thanks, Dr. Lin. Thanks, Manu. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Thank, Thank you. you. Have and a good happy day. Valentine's, everyone. Oh, and keep my head out. Bye bye. <laughs>